All right, so let's get back to the integral, the Riemann integral. Um, so we have a way to characterize if functions are Riemann integrable. Uh, and then what we want to do, is, you know, similar to what we've done for things like building up continuous functions or differentiability, is to say let's start with some building blocks. And if we know some sort of building block functions are integrable, can we build more complicated functions out of them and say, oh, that's automatically integrable too without having to do a ton of extra work of going through the definition and constructing all these upper and lower sums. Uh, so that's mostly the goal of today, and then we should get into the fundamental theorem of calculus as well. So properties of the integral. Okay, so we'll have a bunch of results on how to build up integrable functions. Uh, I will prove some of them, but not all of them here. You can always go, go back to the book to see the proofs or try these yourselves. Uh, so these first couple I'm just going to state. Uh, so let's say we have two functions that are integrable. On some interval. And k is some number. Okay, then we can conclude that k times f is integrable. Okay, and we can tell you what the value of this thing is going to be. Right? This is just the old rule that you get to pull out constants. Okay, and secondly, if you add these two functions together or subtract them from each other, you get something that you can integrate. Okay, and again, this is just the rule that we can split up the integral into pieces as long as each of the component pieces is integrable. So this is integral of f plus or minus the integral of g. OK, the proof is, I'm not going to do it here. The proof is short. Uh, it just follows from writing down basically the definition of the Riemann integral. Uh, so it's a great exercise to try on your own or, or look up, it up in the book and make sure you understand it. Uh, and then the second one is a sort of comparison result. That again, we have f and g are integrable on a to b. Okay, and if f always sits below g, so we'll say f of x is always less than g of x or equal to it on this interval. Right, then if we integrate f, we're going to get a smaller result than if we integrate g. OK, again, this is going to follow from writing down the definition of the Riemann integral. Uh, and on any particular partition, the Riemann sum you do of this guy is going to be less than the Riemann sum you do of this guy. OK, so those you believe, I think. Uh, let's do some more interesting ones. OK, so another one is that if, again, f is integrable on a, b then so is its absolute value. Okay, and moreover, again, we get a sort of comparison result, which I think is sort of intuitive, that if we integrate f and take the absolute value of this, you know, f could be positive, it could be negative, so you get some cancellation happening. Um, so this will be smaller than what you get if you're just 
integrating the absolute value and forcing all these areas to add up. Okay, so this one, um, the next couple I want to try to prove. So again, we're going to come back to the definitions we have. Uh, we have two ways of proving integrability, basically, right? We have the definition, and we have this characterization in terms of looking at the upper and lower sums and comparing them. Okay, so let's write down what we know. First of all, we know we're going to need an epsilon. OK, so what do I know? I know that f is integrable, so I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write down what that means. It means that from last time, there exists a partition p of a, b, such that right, the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is less than epsilon. OK, so I wrote down what I know. And now we're going to have to try to use these to get something that looks like upper or lower sums now of the absolute value of f. So let's write down the component pieces that we need for this. Uh, we're going to let okay, I'm going to let ij be this interval, just so I don't have to write it every time. All right, so mj, mj is our usual mj. It's the supremum uh, in this interval of f of x. Uh, and then because I know that I'm going to want to also look at upper sums of the absolute value of x, we should also come up with a supremum of the absolute value, which might be different. So this I'm going to call mj tilde. This is going to be the supremum of my absolute value function in this interval. OK, and then we do the same thing for the infimums. So we'll have little mj is the infimum of f. And little mj tilde is the infimum of the absolute value of f. OK, so when I start doing, when I start calculating this, right, I'm going to get something that involves the difference between big mj and little mj, yes? So I have big mj times my interval width minus little mj times my same interval width, and I add those up. So it's really the difference between this and this that's going to pop up in the thing that I have, and it's going to be the difference between the mj tildes that are going to pop up in the thing that I actually want to estimate. So I need to somehow really compare those differences if I'm going to have any hope of comparing the difference between these upper and lower sums. OK, so let me start with the thing I want. We need to know something about about this term, mj tilde minus little mj tilde. Okay, and we're going to try to manipulate these somehow to get them in terms of the difference between the original m's, because those are the things that we know about. So let's write down what these are. This is the supremum for x and ij of absolute value of f minus the infimum of the absolute value of x. Okay. 
I'm going to do a game here where I try to write these both as supremums, and I can do that by just taking the negative sign inside of here. Right, so this guy I'm going to leave the same. And then I'm going to write this as plus the supremum over ij of negative f of x. Uh, let's call this actually y. How is that the same thing? So what I've said here is I'm trying to find the point where f of x is as small as possible, right? So now I flipped the sign, uh, and it's going to be equivalent to trying to find the place where minus f is as big as possible. Okay, which is the supremum, <laughs> if I put these all together, of absolute value of f of x minus absolute value of f of y. Okay. Now, I need to try to get this. I still have this in terms of absolute value of this, absolute value of this. I need to get this in terms of um, just f itself at these two different points because, again, we're trying to get it in terms of these regular m's that just involve f itself. So what's one of my tricks or inequalities for moving uh, absolute value signs around? The triangle inequality is always a good tool. Right? So what does a triangle inequality say here? The triangle inequality says that if I look in here, we'll keep that part the same. I can, maybe I'll break this down into pieces just once. So here, f of x, I'm going to write as uh, f of x minus f of y plus f of y. So this is less than or equal to, if I take, now we're going to do this, and we're going to group things like this. So my triangle inequality says absolute value of f of x is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus f of y plus the absolute value of f of y. And this term I'm not touching. This term I'm leaving alone. Okay, this is something that always works with your triangle inequality. Absolute value of this minus absolute value of this is bounded by the absolute value of the difference between these two things. That's just triangle inequality with a twist. And this was our triangle inequality. Okay, and that's starting to look good, right? Because now I'm comparing f at different points directly instead of taking their absolute values before I compare them. Okay, so if I write this down, <coughs> this was equal to the supremum in this one little subinterval of absolute value of f minus y. Okay, so I'm looking in one subinterval and I'm saying I'm taking f at any point in there and f at any other point in there. I'm trying to find the two points that make this as large as possible. Uh, what is the biggest possible difference going to be? Yeah. Big mj minus little mj, right? The place where I'm going to make this difference is to say, on the one hand, let's find the point where f is big as possible in this interval. Let's find the point where f is as small as possible in this interval and compare those. That difference is going to be the upper bound on what this can do. It will be the smallest upper bound on what this can do. So this is actually nothing but big MJ minus little mj. All 
right? So this is what we wanted. We wanted to start with this difference that we didn't know anything about, but we know it's going to pop up. And we've said, OK, it's not equal to this difference, but we can relate it to this difference. We can put it in terms of it. OK, so let's go back to these upper sums and lower sums. So now if we want to do s of f bar on this partition minus little s of f bar on this partition, sorry, let's call this the absolute value of f. Right, so we're trying to show that the absolute value of f is integrable. That means it's reasonable lo to look at the difference between the upper sum and lower sum. This partition is the same partition that we were using to look at uh, f of x itself. Okay, and now we know this is equal to the sum over all our subintervals of mj tilde minus little mj tilde times xj minus xj minus 1. Right? So just the mj times this gives me my upper sum, and the little mj times this gives me my lower sum. <coughs> OK, and now we know that we can, OK, we don't know exactly what this is equal to, but we know we can take this difference here and say it's certainly less than or equal to what we get if we remove the tildes. So this is less than or equal to mj minus little mj, again, times this interval width. Okay, again, this looks like the difference between an upper sum. So this mj times this difference, we sum them up, gives me my upper sum of my original function. This gives me my lower sum of my original function. So this is precisely the upper sum of f minus the lower sum of f. Okay, and this we wrote down right at the beginning. We said for any epsilon greater than zero, we know there exists a partition P such that this difference is less than epsilon because this function is integrable. So this we know to be less than epsilon. Okay, and that is precisely the statement that the absolute value of F is integrable. Questions on that part? Right, so it's just trying to write down the characterization that we had for integrability. Pick which characterization you want, either the definition or this upper sum minus lower sum, and then trying to manipulate it into the result that we want. OK, secondly, we had this comparison result that I wrote down before. I didn't prove it. Um, it's in your book. But we know that f of x is always less than the absolute value of f of x. Right? So that means if I integrate f, I should get something less than if I integrate the absolute value. And I know that minus f of x is also less than the absolute value of f. Right? f could be positive, it could be negative. But even if I take its absolute value, we're going to get something that's always less than or equal to, obviously, the absolute value. So we're going to also have that minus the integral of f of x is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value function. Right? So if I take the absolute value of this entire integral, 
it's either equal to this value of the integral or the negative of it, depending on whether it's positive or negative. Either way, it's going to be less than this integral. So we can conclude that the absolute value of the integral of f is certainly less than what we would get if we integrated the absolute value function. Again, we miss out on the cancellations that would happen. And that was the result we were going for. <clears throat> Questions on this result? Happy with it? OK, I can build up other functions. Uh, so another result is that if f is integrable, then so is f squared. OK, so same game. I'm going to choose an epsilon. We know we need an epsilon. Um, secondly, uh, it's good enough for me to focus on functions that are positive. Why is that the case? When I square a negative function, it's just positive, yeah. But um, I don't want to assume this, that if I have a po right, I can't assume. This statement says it should work all the time, right? We know this is positive. This might be positive or negative. I'm claiming that it's enough for me to assume it's positive, right? Why is it enough for me to assume that it's positive? From the last theorem, exactly, right? This is integrable. That means its absolute value function is integrable. And f squared is the same as absolute value of f squared. So I can write that since f is integrable, So it is the absolute value of f. So I'm going to work with this function, this function, which is, of course, always non-negative. We never want to prove things completely from scratch if we can help it, right? It's always nice to build on our earlier results. OK, so I'm going to do the same kind of things that I did before. Um, we have our epsilon. We know this guy is integrable. So that means there exists uh, some partition. Let's see, how do I want to write this? Let's start by focusing on any particular partition. So let's consider a uh, partition P of AB. Okay, we're going to again be trying to look at the difference between upper and lower sums of the thing we want and compare it to the thing we've got. So let's let MJ be equal to the supremum on ij of the absolute value of f. OK, so that means that the supremum over ij of f of x squared is equal to what? mj squared, exactly. Right, this only works because this function is positive, right? I could have a function that's negative. Maybe if I just had f itself, f might go from minus 1 to 0, for example, and its supremum would be 0, whereas the supremum of f squared would be 1, right? So this only works because I'm dealing with a positive function here as, as my sort of building block. 
I'm going to note this. This only works since absolute value is bigger than or equal to zero. <coughs> okay, uh, same deal with my little m's. This is the infimum of absolute value and the infimum of f of x squared is then little mj squared. Okay, and I'm going to let capital M equal to uh, the supremum not on ij but on the entire interval of my absolute value function, which we know is bounded, right? How do we know it's bounded? Close. Close. Okay, it's not a continuous function necessarily. How do I know it's bounded? Okay, how do I know f is bounded? It's integrable, exactly. I know it's bounded because it's integrable. Okay, so this is an actual number since this guy is integrable. Okay, so I have all of these things. And now let's try to look at these upper sums and lower sums and see if we can get a handle on them. So we want the upper sum of f squared over a partition, and we're going to decide later what partition we want. Okay, so this is just like we did before, right? I need the supremum of this on each little subinterval, that was mj squared, minus the infimum on any little subinterval, that was little mj squared, times the width of my little subinterval. Okay, and we know that we want to try to do what we did before. We'd love to get this in terms of something that involves big MJ minus little MJ. So can I extract a big MJ minus little MJ? Yes, yeah, it's this difference of squares. I can factor it. So this is, okay, I factor it, little MJ, big MJ minus little MJ times my interval width. This term I'm happy with. This term I'm happy with. This term is in my way right now. The good news for all of these calculations is I'm not trying to do anything exact here. I'm not trying to find out the exact value of this. All I need is to come up with a bound and try to force this to be less than epsilon. Okay, I have bounds on this, right? We know that our function is bounded. That means this is less than capital M. This is less than capital M. So this is certainly less than 2m times everything that's left. All right, and now we're in business, right? This is now upper sum minus lower sum of my original absolute value function. So this is 2m times my upper sum minus my lower sum. What's the end goal? The end goal is to make this less than epsilon. Can I make this less than epsilon? Sure, I can, right? I can make this as small as I want, right? I can find a partition that makes this as small as I want. So we know that we can find a partition, partition such that this difference here, minus little s, the same thing, 
is less than. Well, what do I want it less than? I want this whole thing less than epsilon. So I should have it less than epsilon over 2m. And if we can do that, then it follows that all those calculations we just did, which on the left-hand side, we had this thing, upper sum of f squared minus lower sum of f squared. This is going to be less than epsilon. And that's precisely the conclusion we wanted, that f squared is integrable, right? Because we found a partition. We only, again, we only needed to find one partition. And we've managed to find one partition such that this difference is less than epsilon. And that's it. We're done. So f squared is also integrable. We happy with this? You believe that you believe it that if I take an integrable function and square it, I get a new integrable function? Okay, now you know that we want to be able to do more complicated things with functions than just add them together or square them. Now I have the machinery to start combining functions in more interesting ways. So the theorem is if f and g are integrable on a, b, then so is the product of these two functions. OK, that's more interesting, because now I can start stringing together all sorts of different functions to build something complicated if this theorem is really true. Uh, and it turns out we've already done actually all the work for this theorem. Uh, we did it sneakily. There's a little trick here. So the trick is to write f times g as, in a very clever way. So f times g is 1 quarter of f plus g squared minus f minus g squared. Right? So if you multiply this out, f squared minus f squared goes away. g squared minus g squared goes away. Here we get 2fg. Here we get a minus 2fg with another minus sign. That's 4fg. And I divide out the 4. So this is a sneaky way of writing f times g. And it's a sneaky way that's going to make our life a whole lot easier. Um, I don't need any epsilons. I don't need to look at any partitions or upper sums or anything. I'm going to look at this and say, we already have a theorem that says f plus g is integrable. So we know that f plus or minus g are integrable. So we have a new integrable function. OK, I have a new integrable function. That means I can square it and get something that's also integrable. We just did all that work. OK, so I have these two functions that are integrable. I can take their difference, and again, I get a new integrable function. I can take that new function and multiply it by a constant. I get a new integrable function. Right? So we know that this constant times this integrable function is integrable. And that's it. So the moral of the story is use the old theorems that you proved. This would be messy. If I, had to act, if I just took this from scratch and said, I'm going to start writing down upper sums and lower sums of this guy, and I'm going to try to somehow manipulate it to involve upper sums of this and lower sums of this and stuff like that, okay, it could be done, but it would not be that fun. 
it's a lot easier to do those manipulations with very simple things like the absolute value of f or f squared. Uh, but now with a simple trick, boom, we got it in like three lines. How do you derive this formula? Yeah, so this is, of course, the hard part of the proof is recognizing this trick. And so to some extent, it, it, is, a, it is a sneaky trick, right? I probably wouldn't put this question like that on an exam and expect you to just know a trick like this. Because oh. it's not the first thing that comes to mind. So absolutely, this is an absolutely sneaky trick, but it's a sneaky trick that makes life a whole lot easier. And it's easy to verify that this formula is correct. Oh. Absolutely less easy. It would take a little bit of trial and error to say, how can I write this in terms of things that I already know? And I mean, I've legitimately spent six months on proofs where the final proof ended up being like this long. Because um, once you see how to do it, it's easy. But Seeing the trick is not always easy. <laughs> All right. Um, we also have a mean value theorem for integrals. Um, so oh, maybe I'll do the picture of it. So the picture of it is that I have a function a to b, this is my function f of x. Uh, and we're looking, f when we integrate this, we're looking for the area under the curve. Um, the theorem is going to say that, let me get a different color pen. That I could equate this to the area of a particular rectangle. If I pick the height right, so keep the width the same, and pick the height right, and do, say, this rectangle. This might be a little too short. Close enough. Right. This rectangle will have the same height. And this value here is going to be the value of f at some in-between point. So in this case, this might be my c. Right? So it's just saying, I want to integrate this. Somewhere out there, there's a way to just fix f at a constant value and just say, actually, it's good enough to integrate this constant function. Okay, so this is the theorem. So if u is continuous on a, b, OK, that makes sense that I should need this to be a continuous function, right? Because um, this is discontinuous, it could spend some time down here and then jump and spend some time up here. And the intermediate value I need is in between the jump. So we need continuity. We need to make sure our function actually passes through this value. So if it's continuous on here, then there exists some c such that u of c is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of u of x. This, it's the same statement. I've just moved the width of this over, right? So this is the total area under the curve. Then this is the height, the constant height that I'm picking for my rectangle. And this is the width that I would have for my rectangle. OK, um, again, we don't want to do this completely from first principles. We want to use other theorems of calculus that we know. Uh, if you had to take a guess at what theorem of calculus might be useful for this, what would you guess? OK, maybe a mean value theorem. What else? Maybe an intermediate value theorem? Yeah. So, so, so again, those are the one, natural ones that you mind should come to is saying, can I use those? Um, so that's what we're going to try to use. We're going to try to use one of those theorems because we already know that a lot of work was done to 
show you know, existence of some point where a function equals some other value. We've just got to be a little clever how we write this. Okay, So u is continuous. That means it's certainly bounded. We know that. Yeah, Elliot. Why are we writing f as u? Uh, it doesn't matter what we call it. Do you prefer I call it f? It doesn't matter. OK. It's good to get used to things with different names. Uh, we're writing f as u because, for whatever reason, I changed notation when I wrote this theorem. And now I want to at least be consistent with what I started, but it doesn't matter. So u is continuous. It's bounded. That means there exists a little m and a big M such that u always lies between these two values. OK, and we have comparison results uh, for when we integrate. So we know that okay, this is a function. It's a constant function. The integral of this is going to be less than or equal to the integral of this, which is going to be less than or equal to the integral of this. That was one of our comparison results for the integral. So we know that the integral of m is less than or equal to the integral of u, less than or equal to the integral of capital M. Okay, so this we can integrate exactly, right? This is m times b minus a, big M times b minus a. So I can write that little m is less than or equal to if I move the b minus a over, less than or equal to capital M. OK, what else do we know? When u is a continuous function, we started with the assumption that u is a continuous function. That means not only is it bounded, not only, you know, it has a supremum and an infimum that are legitimate numbers, m and m, but actually it attains them as a minimum and a maximum. Right? So since u is continuous, it actually attains its min and max. Okay, that is, there's going to exist some numbers, a1 and b1, that belong to ab, such that u of a1 is little m, and u of b1 is big M. Okay, so what do I have? I have a continuous function, and I know at two particular points I have u of a1 less than or equal to this value here. This value is a number, right? It's, an, it's not a function, it's just some value, which is less than or equal to u of b1. Okay, so what do my theorems tell me now? My old theorems from calculus that we did a few weeks ago. Right? You just, yeah, Joe? There has to exist a Okay. Exactly. So there has to, ex right? So we're saying you as a continuous function. Um, we've picked two points, u a1 and b1, and we've said here's some number that lives between the value of u at this point and the value of u at this point. That means there exists a c that lives between a1 and b1 such that u exactly takes on this value. That's our intermediate value theorem. 
So the intermediate value theorem says there exists some C between A1 and B1 such that U of C is exactly equal to this number. Right, we're used, to call, we're used to seeing this number not in a complicated expression, but just as a number. I don't remember what we called it. Uh, but still, it's just a value. And we can go back into our intermediate value theorem and replace that value with this expression, which is still just a value. And this is precisely what the theorem tells us. And again, that's exactly what we wanted. Now we can go and say, OK, so you at this particular point, if I take that as my height and I multiply it by this width, right, I get this area of a rectangle that's precisely equal to the value of the integral. So that was the result that we wanted. <coughs> Questions? OK, so we have some nice properties of integrals. Now, we, I, we probably can't really say that we're doing calculus unless we hit the fundamental theorem of calculus, where it says we have these two kind of different things, derivatives and integrals, and they're actually intimately connected to each other. And we should now have, now that we know about derivatives and we know a lot about integrals, we should have the tools to combine these things. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, there's two parts to it. So part one, first of all. Right, so let's let f be an integrable function on an interval. Okay, and I'm going to define capital F of x to be equal to the integral from a to x of this guy. OK, now the theorem says that if f happens to be continuous at some point in the interval, c belonging to a, b, OK, then we can take the derivative of this guy here and we simply get little f of c. Okay, so I want to prove this. Um, I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to write down what I know. And then I'm going to start writing down the thing that I'm trying to get at. Okay, well, what's one thing I know? I know f is continuous at this point c that we're interested in. We were given that. So since f is continuous, What does that mean? That means I'm just going to write down the definition. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if, okay, if we're close enough to C, then f of t minus f of C stays less than epsilon. So we'll record that fact. Um, hopefully we'll use it later. If we don't use it later, then there was no reason to have this statement in the theorem. <coughs> and what do I want? I want to take a derivative of this function. Um, so in the absence of anything simple that involves elementary functions that I have rules for, we go back to the definition of the derivative, right? That's always our fallback if we don't have another tool. 
So we need to compute. We need to pr uh, prove that capital F is differentiable at C. <coughs> and we want to show actually what its value is with capital F prime of C equals F of C. OK, so we have a goal. Our goal is to say, well, I don't have any simple rule for computing this, so I'm going to write down the limit definition of it, that the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. I want to show that this is equal to little f of c. This is a reasonable goal? Yes? OK. All right. So uh, again, we're trying to show something about a limit. We have a definition of a limit. We know how to play with these things. So we should pick an epsilon. And we should restrict our attention to uh, values of x that are close to c. <coughs> where, where am I going to get a delta? Um, this is the only obvious place to pull a delta out of, so let's use this. So we'll say where delta comes from the continuity of little f. OK, so let's write this down. We know that we need to look at the difference between this and f of c, and we try to make that less than epsilon. So capital F of x minus capital F of c over x minus c minus little f of c. This is the thing we need to work with. <coughs> uh, and now I better actually write down what capital F is. Capital F was given as this integral. Okay, All right, which is well defined. Little f is integrable. That's no problem. So this is one over x minus c times, and what do we have? The integral from a to x of f of t dt minus the integral from a to c of f of t dt minus little f of c. OK, we should do some simplification here. So if I'm integrating from a to x and then subtracting off the integral from a to c, what's left? C to the integral from c to x. Okay. Again, you can prove that um, fairly easily using just these definitions of the integrals. I'm not going to write down that proof. Again, it should be in your book. So what's left? The integral from c to x of f of t dt. And I need to play with f of c. So what I'm going to try to do is try to write it in a similar form as this. Because I know, I'm pretty sure at some point, I'd like to compare the value of f at two different points, right? because I know something about that. Right? I picked this delta to come from my 
continuity definition, that means that I wanted to use it somehow. So what I'm going to do is say, can I write this in this form? So I need, if I'm going to compare these things, I need to have them both under the integral. What do I have to do to this to make it equal? Just divide out the x minus c, exactly. Okay, so this is 1 over x minus c times the absolute value of the integral from c to x of f of t minus f of c. Okay, so what I'd really like to do is compare f of t minus f of c under the absolute value sign. Um, at the moment, I don't have them under the absolute value sign, right? I integrate them first and then take the absolute value. Is that a problem? No, right? Because we've proved things about what happens when you integrate absolute values, right? We know that, okay, this may have cancellation. It's going to get bigger if I move the absolute value inside. Right? And we know this is valid. If this is integrable, this is integrable. We proved that. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, so now I'm going to move to the other board, but before I erase this, we're going to keep in mind that we have a bound on this guy. Right? We've, we've kept x close to c within delta of c. That means t is also within delta of c. And that means I'm in this regime where I can say f of t minus f of c, definitely less than epsilon. And if f of t minus f of c is less than epsilon, then the integral of f of t minus f of c is less than the integral of epsilon. That was our comparison result. So this is less than 1 over x minus c times the integral c to x of epsilon dt and this was continuity. And I should be taking, let's see, I should be preserving probably the absolute values around here because I don't really know if x is bigger or less than c. And then we're in business. 1 over x minus c times, now this guy can integrate exactly, epsilon x minus c is epsilon. And that's what we wanted, right? Now, if we go back and say, OK, what, what did we prove exactly? We proved this thing is less than epsilon, right? We can, we can find a delta such that as long as x is sufficiently close to c, this whole thing is less than epsilon. That's precisely the statement that the limit of this guy as x goes to c is equal to this, right? And that's what we wanted. That was the goal we wrote down at the beginning, to prove that limit, because that limit tells us what the derivative of big F is. So we've exactly proved our goal that capital F prime of C is equal to little f at C. Are we happy with that? Questions? Okay, that's part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Then we have part two. Okay, so this says if f is differentiable on AB and f prime is integrable. on AB, 
then we can integrate it. Right, and the value of this integral is going to depend only on the value of f at the endpoint. So f of b minus f of a. So this time, the thing we're fundamentally trying to prove is the value of an integral. So we should go back to how do we define an integral, and how, how do, what's the definition of this integral being equal to this number, right? That really means we need partitions again. OK, so let's let p be a partition of a to b, and uh, we'll decide a little later uh, if we want to put some conditions on this partition. And we better start doing some Riemann sums of this guy. So we need to do Riemann sums of f prime over our partition. Okay, so that means we need to look at terms of this form. Okay, or so we're going to be adding up a bunch of terms that look like this f prime of cj times xj minus xj minus 1, where cj belongs to xj minus 1, xj. Yes, and then we're going to add all these things up. Now, I already know that as I do this and as I refine my partition, these Riemann sums are going to converge. We know that because we were already told that f prime is integrable, right? The thing we don't know is the value of the integral. That's what we're trying to prove. Okay, so we already know that these Riemann sums are going to behave themselves somehow. We just don't know what exactly it is that they're converging to. Um, we do know that I would love to, at the end of the day, get an expression that doesn't actually involve f prime, that just involves f. Um, so how can I take an expression that involves f prime and relate it to just values of f? Limit? What else? Mean value theorem. Mean value theorem is a great way to do that, right? So this is some point that lives in an interval. Again, I'm not going to care that much which point it is because I know whichever point it is. These Riemann sums converge. We know that these Riemann sums will converge. Uh, so let's try our mean value theorem. So let's use mean value theorem to relate f prime back to f. Okay, so we know there exists some cj belonging to xj minus 1 xj such that f prime of cj times xj minus xj minus 1. Right? So this is my slope. This was my run, which I've moved over to this side. This is going to be my rise. This is f of xj minus f of xj minus 1. <coughs> OK, so now let's look at a Riemann sum. OK, so a Riemann sum of f over p is sigma is 
we add all these things up. J equals 1 to n, f prime cj, xj minus xj minus 1. It is a Riemann sum of f prime over p. Thank you. And now we have a nice simple expression for this because we've carefully picked our cj's. So this is nothing but the sum of f of xj minus f of xj minus 1. Which is equal to what? f of b minus f of a. These are good old telescoping series that we've seen a million times in different forms. This is f of b minus f of a. Okay, so this worked for any partition. So that means, in particular, the lower sums are going to be less than the value of this Riemann sum, which are going to be less than the upper sums. for any partition P. And, and that means uh, if I take all my lower sums and take the supremum of them, the supremum is still going to be bounded by this. Okay, the supremum of those is my lower integral. And similarly, if I take the in FEMA of all my upper sums, I get my upper integral, and that's going to stay bounded. <coughs> um, but f prime is integrable, right? f prime is integrable. We were given that in our theorem statement. That means that this is actually equal to this. So since f prime is integrable, it must be that the lower sum is equal to the upper sum. It should be f prime. And the only way to pull that off is to have them both equal to f of b minus f of a, right? And but we know that, okay, the lower sum is equal, the lower integral is equal to the upper integral, is equal to the actual integral itself, is equal to f of b minus f of a. And that's what we wanted. So this is our fundamental theorem of calculus, both directions. Um, any questions on it? Right. It's not so, so hard to prove once we have the building blocks in place. It, it took a while to get the building blocks in place. Um, but by not trying to do everything from scratch, it's not so hard to prove fairly complicated results, which I'd say that's not obvious by any means, but not so much work. Uh, we can integrate by parts. So let's suppose that f and g are differentiable on my interval and the derivatives are uh, integrable. All I'm asking really is that all the terms that show up in my integration by parts formula actually make sense. Okay, then the integral of f times g prime
is equal to, okay, we take an antiderivative of this and apply it at the end point. So f of b, g of b, minus f of a, g of a. And then we subtract off the result where we swap who gets the derivative applied to him. That's our usual integration of a parts formula, um, which you've seen it in different ways potentially. Uh, this is the way I'm going to write it for this theorem. Okay, so first of all, I just want to verify that these things all make sense, right? So we've assumed that uh, f, f is differentiable, therefore it's continuous, therefore it's integrable. g prime is integrable, the product is integrable. Okay, so th that term makes sense. The same deal over here. This product is integrable. It makes sense. Okay, so all the integrals are certainly well defined. That's important. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the integrals over to one side. And I'm going to write the integral of um, f g prime dx plus the integral of f prime g dx. We know we can collect those under one integral, right? This is integrable, this is integrable, their sum is integrable. So f g prime plus f prime g dx. And how can I simplify that expression? Can you, can you recognize it? It's the derivative of f times g, exactly. So this is d by dx of f of x, g of x. <clears throat> and now we're in good shape. Integral of a derivative, we just did that. Right? And we know it's determined by just the value of this guy at the endpoints. So that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that's it. That's the whole proof. Right, now you can rearrange this, move this back over to the right hand side, and you've got the result. Again, very non-obvious formula. It's not hard to prove as long as you keep remembering the other results that we have and just build on them. Okay, and then the last formula I'll do today is the change of variables formula. Because now we're starting to be able to have formulas for very complicated integrals, potentially. Just from building blocks of saying, I have a definition of an integral, and apply this once or twice to figure out that I can integrate then the absolute value function and the squared function. And that was really the only places where we applied these complicated definitions very much. Oh. OK, so let's let x equal v of t uh, map t in an interval cd onto x in an interval ab. A with phi of c equals a and phi of b, sorry, phi of d equals b. All right, the game is going to be we're integrating over this interval, and we're going to do a change of variables at x equals phi of t is our change of variables so that we're integrating now over c d. OK, uh, let f be continuous. And 
and let phi prime be integrable. Okay, then the result is that the integral from a to b f of x dx is the same as is our usual change of variables formula, c to d, uh, f of v of t times r phi prime t dt. Okay, usual change of variables formula. I'm not going to write out the proof here. It's not that long. I'm just running out of time. Um, but it is in the book, and it's really just fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, you write out carefully sort of how things are defined. You apply the fundamental theorem of calculus carefully, and a complicated result like this falls out. So for the proof, I'll say, see the book. All you really need is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so that's lots of properties of integrals. We started from ending last class with a fairly complicated way to decide if something's integrable. Now we can take really complicated functions and sort of look at them at a glance and say, oh yeah, that's integrable. And maybe have some ways of even calculating them. So I'll leave you there. <laughs>